Okay. So I think I gave everyone access to screen share. So when it's your turn to present, let me know if it doesn't work or anything, but I'll start off with this. So welcome to our social justice virtual gallery. And today we'll be exploring the concepts of justice, identity, and strength through art and written work, as well as presentations. So this is just a little schedule that we have. And we will start off with the first presentation. Let me know if this screen sharing doesn't work or anything. And I'll keep this up as a little introduction. All right. Um, thank you so much for having me um, as I prepare to share my screen. I hope that everyone can see this pretty clearly. Are we all set? Can we yeah. see my screen? Okay, perfect. Um, my name is Latricia Adams. I am the founder, CEO, and president um, of an organization called Black Millennials for Flint. Um, today, I'm just going to give you just a little bit of context about who we are as an organization, um, the work that we do, and hopefully inspire you to do some of the work um, that we're doing in combination or in alignment with what you already do um, within your respective communities. Um, so Black Millennials for Flint was actually founded on the East Coast in the D.C. area. Um, we came about in the wake of the Flint water crisis. Um, while the Flint water crisis actually happened, or the switch from um, the Detroit water source to the Flint River actually took place in 2014. It wasn't until 2015 when it actually hit um, more national media sources. Um, at that particular time, I lived in the DC area. Um, I was president of an organization called Thursday Network with the Greater Washington Urban League, which is an affiliate chapter of the National Urban League. And so in full transparency, I felt at that time that some of our more civil rights organizations um, and even some of our big green organizations really weren't providing that immediate direct support and resources to the Flint community. And so at that time, millennials, we were kind of the, the babies of the bunch, if you will. Um, and so I'm so excited that we have a generation that is now of age um, and, and able to fight the same fight. Um, so we partnered with several other um, youth and young adults across the country where we initially did a series of water drives. And then we kind of took a pivot where we not just focused on providing those direct, direct resources, which we still continue to do, um, but we also began to get our feet wet and are now fully engaged on the political advocacy front, particularly as it relates to environment. So some of our key um, excuse me, our core values is around community, education, Black and Latinx lives, equity, and a led for USA. Um, so while we have a key focus area around lead in all of its forms, whether it be lead in drinking water and soil and housing and the air, consumer products, y'all, lead exposure can happen at any place, anytime. Um, we do also focus on um, other environmental toxins that disproportionately impact communities of color and communities that are in economic distress. In addition to our national work, particularly with policy and now post COVID, we do quite a bit of um, educational um, events and activities that have a broader reach. We do have four cities that we work in where we do more boots on the ground work. That is in the city of Baltimore, also within our namesake in Flint, Michigan, um, in Memphis, Tennessee, which is actually my hometown, um, and of course, Washington, D.C. as well. Oops. There we go. So a little bit about our four point action plan. So I mentioned earlier that part of the work that we started was around um, getting resources and funding uh, to support um, our core city, which is in Flint, Michigan, um, but realized that there are resources, whether it ranges from getting lead testing in homes with lead paint, with getting water filters and the like, um, that takes money. So we do quite a bit of work around pooling resources um, so that money won't be an issue when folks are trying to create healthy and lead-free homes and communities. We also do quite a bit of work for advocating for, again, 
all the ways in which lead, um, you can come into contact with lead exposure. It's not just specific to water. There's a myriad of ways in which lead can be, you can be exposed to lead. So we do quite a bit of educational awareness as well as prevention work with that, which ties into our third four point action plan item, um, which is the education piece. Uh, we're still fairly young. Uh, and so we try to come up with more innovative ways to engage um, sometimes in the environmental justice space, it can be a little bit technical and a little bit heavy. So we really utilize a lot of our time and resources to create creative ways to engage. That's why I'm so glad that you all are doing this very necessary work with the intersection of environment and also art. Um, art has helped us to transcend all sorts of movements, movements over time. Um, so I'm really excited to see the work that you all do. And then the other part is very uh, connected to our space and convening this evening with building coalitions with like-minded organizations. We are a small but mighty organization and it is with our, our allies, our partners that we're really able to move the pendulum um, as it relates to creating this this Northern Star or achieving this Northern Star of a lead for USA. So as I get into a little bit more um, of core aspects of what I wanna leave you all with, if you don't remember anything else, if you didn't know, I want you to understand the grounding of how the environmental justice movement was established. So when we look at the full landscape of your big green organizations, so that would be like your Sierra Clubs, which is very long standing, um, your environmental defense funds, your NRDC, so on and so on. These very large NGOs, if you will, are majority run by white folks. However, the environmental justice movement was actually found by two African American people who are honored and held in high regard um, for their work with setting that foundation. So the father of environmental justice, Dr. Robert Bullard, um, Dr. Robert Bullard was the first um, person within the higher, am, in higher ed or in academia that actually introduced this concept from a perspective of um, a scholastic presence. Um, so some of the first research that was, that was published and presented and used all across classrooms across the country and referenced in policy all stemmed from Dr. Robert Bullard. With um, the mother of environmental justice, Ms. Hazel Johnson, who is now um, among the ancestors, her work started in public housing in Chicago, Illinois. Um, she is not a quote unquote environmentalist by trade, but someone who truly cared about her own public health, that of her family, and most importantly, that of her community. And so she spent into her, her, her last days advocating for clean and healthy housing and really opposing these big um, toxic polluters um, to protect herself and her community. And we hold her in high regard and like to open up anything that we speak of with environmental justice with honoring her as well as Dr. Bullard, who's still very young at heart, live and kicking and still um, fighting for environmental justice. So also a couple of things to take note of and which you may be privy to. Um, it's also really important when we talk about environmental justice that we govern ourselves with two critical aspects. The first thing is the 17 principles of environmental justice. So with these two folks that I mentioned, they're actually two of the founders among many black and brown, so black, Latinx, um, indigenous, uh, Pacific Island, folks of color, who came together and assembled about 30 years ago in Washington, D.C., and came up with these 17 principles of environmental justice that should truly govern all of our work as we advocate to protect Mother Earth, and then another key component, especially when we think about spaces in which we um, invite um, allies into this space, um, when we really focus on decolonizing um, environmental spaces, we ground ourselves in the Hamez principles, which is really critical um, as it relates to inclusivity and making sure that the heart of the people, that the true aspect of democracy is what is governing our work and our actions. I'm gonna skip over this because it is really wordy and I didn't know that was still in there. Uh, but essentially just with understanding the concept of environmental justice, it's a combination of both civil rights and environment. 
and some other historical aspects of the EJ movement. So one key thing that's not listed here, I mentioned that I am a native of Memphis, Tennessee. You may have seen posters and heard various aspects of the story um, with the unfortunate assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. The reason why he was in Memphis, Tennessee was because of the sanitation worker strike. The sanitation worker strike was actually the springboard of the environmental justice movement. If you're familiar with what caused that protest, it was heinous working conditions and environments, particularly in the sanitation sector where people were losing limbs, people were drastically ill, and then unfortunately people lost their lives. Um, we know that in the 60s and the 70s, there was quite a bit of work being done as it related to um, civil rights. Um, on the other part um, of the South and North Carolina, um, we saw uprisings and we began to see people protest specifically around environmental justice issues, particularly in Warren County and North Carolina, where people were protesting landfills um, that were in complete just overabundance and concentrated in this majority Black um, and economically disenfranchised community. And so just some other interesting movements that kind of are adjacent to this work, of course, with the civil rights movement, um, the anti-toxic movement, which really got its, its um, bearing in the 70s until this day. Also the intersectionality with labor, um, indigenous struggles and, and tribal issues, um, academia, and then of course, mainstream environmentalism. So as I mentioned earlier, here's a phenomenal um, text among many um, from Dr. Robert Bullard, um, Dumping in the Dixie. If you've never read this before, I would definitely recommend it. Um, check it out. It really gives you just a, a very robust understanding of the history of environmental injustices, particularly in black and brown communities. And I'm gonna wrap up here because I wanna be respectful of time. Um, one thing that I want you to think about, um, particularly with understanding what environmental justice is. So I'd like to use this to comparison. So we talk about environmental justice, we're talking about the environment still, but we're talking about people at the core. So how the environment reacts to us and what we are pouring into the environment and then what's the aftermath. Environmental justice also includes all of the various processes that kind of coalesce together um, to make our environment what it is. So that also includes um, what's the impact on uh, income disparities, what are the impacts on public health, what are the impacts on policies and, and laws and the like. All of those things are encompassed into environmental justice. Now you're gonna see this other um, concept um, that is not a bad concept at all. So we think about this whole thing about going green and we see all of these initiatives, we see all of these social media influencers and that's great. But going green is a concept. It doesn't necessarily have people at the core. It more so speaks to ideology and ways in which um, people can govern themselves, but it really isn't focusing on the injustices that cause the environmental toxins at the core. So a key thing to take away from this is people versus process. And so I don't think that we have time um, for this activity. So I will stop there, but I'm more than happy to share this PowerPoint um, out to you all. And I welcome any questions that you may have as well. Thank y'all for inviting me. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I can ask one. So if people want to get involved in your organization or in work similar to your organization, how would they go about doing so? I am going to drop, that's an excellent question. I'm going to drop our um, website and also our social media handles in the chat box. Please follow. Um, and then we also have, I'll put our um, email address in as well. Um, if you don't have questions now, or if you want to partner on something that you'll have the info to reach out to us. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So if no one else has any questions right now, we will move on to the second presentation.
Okay, so Terry, you can feel free to share your screen. I'll stop sharing mine. This is just a little intro that we can look at. All right, thank you for the floor. Um, can I just quickly check if you can all see my screen? Yeah, we can see it, thank you. Great. So, all right, um, hello everyone, I'm Terry Song and I'll be speaking about youth taking action, youth deciding for their own futures. Because in this social justice virtual gallery, I wish to speak about how youth is underrepresented in decision-making tables, especially for their future environment and that their voices are have been oppressed so far and we need to create a space we need to create an area for them to speak up for themselves so to introduce myself quickly i'm a rising ib sophomore at chato international south korea i have great interests in international relations economics and youth activism all because this environmental justice issue roots in how the international and inter like intersectional or interregional areas um, have conflicts with each other. Uh, so I learned a lot in Model United Nations doing networking and a lot of researching. I am the founder and executive director of a youth led organization called Greeners Cleaner. I am a volunteer at Greenpeace Korea. I'm the youth representative of carbon neutrality and resource circulation in the Ministry of Environment and the chairperson of the National Environmental Education Youth Steering Committee. So to talk about my organization, Greener is Cleaner, and how this connects with the youth um, activism and youth representation issue, I would like to first introduce you to our vision and our mission. We are a youth-led organization founded in 2018 that leads by example to empower you to take action for the environment and thus their futures. Because we recognize this issue where youth voices are underrepresented and it has been oppressed so far, we wish to provide opportunities for youth to express themselves and voice themselves for the environment. For example, we um, have these aims of raising awareness. So we create media such as podcasts, um, infographics, YouTube, etc., about environmental issues in all different areas. We empower and inspire by leading by example. This means that we, for example, adopt sustainable practices, sustainable habits, and encourage other people to join. We provide online and offline opportunities to learn and take action for the environment. So this will be things like programs, webinars, competitions. And lastly, we make environmental education more accessible and fun by creating lesson plans, visiting schools and classes to conduct environmental education sessions. And we also um, connect with other organizations to um, share resources for education. Uh, as you may have already know, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are due by 2030, and these are like the main focuses that the United Nations um, activities and programs, all those initiatives revolve around. And our focuses are 11, sustainable cities and communities, 12, responsible consumption and production, and 13, climate action, alter the mechanism of partnership for the goals, which is goal 17, the last one. So by doing all of these things, by focusing on these things, we have impacted and involved over a thousand youth from five different continents, and we have been investing four years for the cause. And to be more specific, our approaches uh, come in three ways. The first thing is service leadership. This is a combination of service as action and leadership as, a, as its own. So what we do to foster service leadership in all the youth is that we develop a network of change makers who lead by example. This not only pertains to the members of the organization, but also the different community channels that we um, organize, such as Discord, um, Instagram, all of those uh, Facebook groups as well. And by connecting these individuals in one place, we get um, more solidarity, we get greater inspiration from each other, and etc. We also use creativity as a mechanism to uh, go and express um, different ideas. 
So we create a space for youth to take action creativity, creatively, promoting the STEAM principles. For example, uh, one of our competition involves uh, SDG essay writing competition. So it can be a creative writing, it can be uh, um, an informative, etc. We also have a junk art competition and a DIY thrifting competition where people, where youth can use their creative skills, they can use their passions for art, ex for example, to connect those passions and interests into environmental activism and voicing out themselves. Lastly, we take sustainable action, we, which means that we don't stop taking action so that we can reach our goal at last. So we are trying to create a sustainable path to reach our goal because we have learned throughout the four years that um, taking action sustainably leads to greater change and taking action together leads to a bigger change because more people are involved and more voices are being heard. The international projects that we provide or conduct are first of all website. We have a website called www.greenercleaner.org where we introduce our projects, we upload weekly website articles that are mostly informative. We have a newsletter subscription for similar causes. For programs, we conduct an Echo Loki conference, which is an international webinar to be uh, in a nutshell, where you join all uh, from all different continents and countries. They discuss a particular social or international environmental issue and discuss solutions together. We usually have guest speakers for these, but the main focus is on the discussion that you have from different countries. The past Ecoloki, like the most recent one that we held was about ending deforestation by 2030 because that is one of the Glasgow Pact promises. And we had um, participants all shared their own countries like progress on ending the first station by 2030 and what they think as an individual about uh, how does this feasible or not and uh, how the countries should work together to actually reach this goal. We also hold a SDG summit um, and a cohort slash fellowship about UN SDGs. We um, whole competitions, as I said before, um, about like DIY drifting, SDGs, echo arts, etc. Some media content to raise awareness that we create are podcasts, YouTube, infographics, reels, and TikTok. So, as use, we try to use as many social media that we can uh, access and we have hold of to raise awareness through all of those channels. But nationally, we have a chapter in South Korea that I run in my school and around my, uh, I, I would say neighborhood or um, town or city. Uh, so what we do are participatory activities such as Green Spirit Week where students get to um, familiarize themselves with um, things that are more eco-friendly and they can learn more about environmental issues. For example, we held a echo raffle where they can get an eco-friendly material. We do walk and roll days where we encourage people to walk and roll instead of riding CO2 emitting um, vehicles. We have like an interview uh, in, involved in the Green Spirit Week to kind of learn more about what different people in our school are thinking about. Um, we are blessed to be, uh, I personally am blessed, blessed to attend an international school. So we are able to interview a whole range of people from all different nationalities and genders, backgrounds, et cetera. We also conduct campaigns and picketing. Um, quite obviously, uh, we have the school strike for the climate in South Korea as well. We partnered with Round Square to start a plogging initiative, a cleanup initiative to involve various youth all around the world. We, uh, for the, our club members, we provide sustainability education we raise awareness and voice the change to um, proposal to the schools and writing an ESG report to the school. Moving on, I'd like to talk about Youth for Climate. So basically our fight and what it is like. Um, on a nutshell, youth activism is an organization of young people to create a change in the community or the system that is rooted in the, for the cause. The key things about youth activism is that our future leads to change so it is led by the future for the future. 
And when we think about activism uh, in the past, it was really like hard to begin. We had hesitation to join. We might think it's extraordinary, it's like abnormal, or maybe something that only experts join. But now as youth take over this movement and more people are joining in this movement, we also value diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this became a more um, inclusive movement that anyone could join and learn and the cause together. But why is youth activism really important and significant? I think there are three reasons. The first one being ideas that transcend those above uh, over um, the past generations. I think a good example would be Boyan Slots, the founder and CEO of the Ocean Cleanup Initiative that um, cleans up trash in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. He was only 18 years old when he founded this initiative and the GPGP has been there for decades. We also have the voice of the future. Greta Thunberg is a good, a good example. Um, yeah, I wouldn't explain too much. And lastly, we have support currently from um, various international organizations, such as the United Nations. And I believe that using these initiatives and using these opportunities for youth to voice themselves and create uh, change in the decision-making table, youth have to take this chance to uh, be there for our futures. So environmental injustice, generational one, comes from the effects because the global average temperature is rising constantly at, a, at an exponential rate, it is quite inevitable that the um, climate change is happening, the global warming is happening, the global average temperature is rising constantly. And this is the future that the current youth will face and the future generations will face. Even the current generations are suffering from uh, the different effects, the disproportionate effects of climate change at the moment. and this will just worsen year by year and generation by generation. However, the thing is that the youth currently are not represented equally. 51% of the world's population is under 30, but only 2% are members of the parliament globally. So how can youth be part of this change? We can mobilize movements, raise awareness and educate people. We can propose policies, be part of the government, parliament, National Assembly, whatever you have, and lobby um, uh, the government. We use science, social media, and solidarity to take action for the environment, and which is one of our key values. So far, youth have been in action, um, despite the inaction of the government. For example, Greta Thunberg, uh, 17, from Sweden. Uh, Lily from Thailand, uh, she is an a plastic, plastic pollution activist where she called different corporations in her country to reduce their plastic consumption and production. You may also know about this very young uh, activist called Lissipriya in India. She protested and took action by uh, showing people and doing protest campaigns, strikes with a plant uh, connected to her uh, breathing mask. And uh, I think one of the earliest example of youth in action could be Severn. She was 12 and she, and she, was, she was born in Canada, but she spoke at the Rio summit about how youth activism is really important and climate change is turning into a climate crisis. Internationally, some actions that have been taken for youth to be more involved in the service action is, for example, in Indonesia, it, they have made a requirement where youth have to take service action for the environment, um, mainly to graduate as a graduation requirement. And nationally in South Korea, we have been campaigning, we have been striking, we have shown the government policies, we have met with politicians. Yeah, here's me. We have also done Asia's first climate litigation so that um, the politicians uh, we can meet with the politicians and discuss it in the decision making table. And so and in March of 2019, which is kind of like the biggest climate strike before COVID-19, 1.6 million youth in 125 countries hit the streets for the Youth for Climate strike. And so far, over this many people from 7,500 cities and all continents are involved in environmental activism 
And this is a statistic recorded by the Fridays for Future organization. Now, to end this presentation, by calling all of you to action, to take action now, I would like to leave this quote, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? By Hillel the Elder. Personally, when I started environmental activism, it was because of my eating disorder, anorexia nervosa. I was suffering from this mental illness and was finding exploring ways in which I can do good for myself and do good for others. And then I've learned about the climate crisis that will quite directly affect my future. And I wondered, I, I asked myself, why is this issue not being solved so far? And I re recognized that it is me who is not taking action. It is me who could take action, but is not doing so. So that is when I decided to take the initiative and lead the change. And I believe all of you can do the same. So that's my parting note. And thank you so much for listening. I left the socials and contacts on the slide. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Okay, if no one has any questions, we'll move on to the third presentation. So here's the intro for Sarah. You can pause the video to watch, to read through this. And I will let you screen share now. Let me know if there's any issues. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. So hi, everyone. Welcome to the Earthburn Social Justice Gallery. My name is Sarah. I'm a top 25 environmentalist in Canada. I'm also a poet and science researcher. It is an honor and privilege to be speaking to here here to all of you tonight and I would like to thank the organizers of the Earthburn Conference for giving me this incredible opportunity. I would also like to thank the presenters as well for their inspiring speeches. It was so educational and inspiring, so thank you so much. Um, for tonight, I'll be talking about one of my projects in the field of climate tech and environmental stewardship, and as well as some tips and advice that have allowed me to successfully reach my goal, and I hope that will help you as well. So I wanna begin with an introduction on how I got involved in the climate activism space. So for me, one of the most important moments in my journey or my career was when I realized the severeness of climate change and it was about in grade four. So our teacher gave us to do a global issues project and I chose climate change. And so when I did a bit of research for this assignment, I ended up discovering these alarming rates and these alarming numbers of the aftermath of climate change. And that's when I really realized that climate change was this huge issue. It was affecting millions of people and immediate attention was required towards this global issue. So while I followed the latest news and was building my passion for STEM at the same time, I remember one day walking into my grade four class and then our teacher had put this quote on the wall and it said, be the change that you wish to see in the world. And this really resonated with me because um, at that time I felt like I wasn't really doing enough or maybe there was something that I couldn't really do. But seeing this quote made me think that I needed to take matters in my own hand, especially seeing how there was less climate tech development in certain areas of um, contributing to repairing some of the damage of climate change. So I began first with community involvement and research different opportunities uh, and then soon slowly transition towards the intersection of STEM and environmental stewardship. And so one of the projects I'll be talking to you about today is um, a project I've been working on for the past two years, and it tackles a problem that we hear quite often. And that problem is oil spills. So exports and imports are very crucial. They're very important for economy and for example, getting produce that we can't grow here in Canada. Um, but the aftermath of these huge boats that um, import and export all these items is really detrimental to the environment. As you can see through these pictures, in just a few days or in just a few hours, multiple oil spills can happen. And um, this in turn causes 1.3 million gallons of oil to end up in our oceans. And because current remediation methods 
aren't that effective. Um, there has still been 4 billion tons of oil left in our oceans to date. And to date, this has killed over 100 animals each year because of hydrocarbon spills in the ocean. So seeing how this was a huge prominent issue and current solutions only remove up to 60% of oil and at the same time there is no sustainable or biodegradable solution, I wanted to see if I could design something with the power of science. And that's when I came across the term biomass. And essentially I decided to focus on the biomass which is orange and pomegranate peels. So before I talk a little bit more in scientific terms, I want to put this concept that is applied in science in a bit more perspective. So imagine a key and each key um, has small grooves that allow us to unlock our doors. So these grooves, they match the lock, allowing the key to slide into place and eventually unlock our door. So this exact phenomenon is what happens in um, a phenomenon in science known as physiorption where um, a gas or a liquid coats onto a solid. So as you'll see in the next slide and the next picture, um, the grooves on the key are similar to the pores on a orange or pomegranate peel. And these pores actually are change of cellulose and polysaccharide content. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure if you can see the image. So I'll just try showing it here. Um, so essentially, when we add heat to any pomegranate orange peel or anything that has really high cellulose or polysaccharide content, we call that thermal modification of polymeric compounds. And that basically stretches all the pores. And so naturally, the substrate or the content will be able to be adsorbed in more ability onto that substrate surface. So in working on my project, um, I definitely did learn a lot in science and um, my final prototype, because there were definitely a lot of trial and errors when working on this project, my final prototype was able to remove 98% of oil, which was my fourth prototype and combined also an aerogel, which I'll be talking about right now. So while I did learn a lot about in the science and how science can be used to repair a lot of the damage done in, by climate change, I also learned about perseverance, growth mindset, and of course, consistency. But the most important thing that I learned and I would like to share with you all today is the fact that there is always room for growth and there will always be an opportunity to 10X your impact. So while my first prototype only removed oil, I still wanted to see if there was an opportunity for my biosorbent to possibly remove more harmful chemicals from water and not just oil on its own. So after doing a lot of research, um, I discovered the term aerogels, and basically an aerogel is the world's lightest solid. And depending on what you can make it from, so for example, for my project, I made it from cellulose and alginate, eventually you're able to remove different chemicals from water sources. And after a lot of trial and error and combination methods, I finally was able to create a biosorbent aerogel combined together that could remove oil, heavy metals, so let's say lead or cadmium from water, and at the same time, different organic compounds with an efficiency of about 98%. Emerging technologies offer so much potential to solving various aspects of the climate crisis. There are many fields of exponential technology, such as carbon capture, nanotech, material sciences, or even cellular agriculture that can really solve some of the world's biggest problems, and they can help us reach our rate at an exponential point. But of course, this is not a one person effort. We need to work collectively to sustain a brighter future. But it's really important to mention though that you also need to be willing to create your own opportunities. So for example, in the climate tech space, when I saw that there wasn't really any improvement in removing oil from waters, um, I decided to take matters into my own hand and create my own opportunity, which was uh, a solution. So you need to be willing to take that first step forward in order for more opportunities to come to you. Networking is very important and so is building that outreach skills. So um, I highly recommend that it's always really good to get advice from industry leaders in the field. So just by reaching out to them, sharing why you're doing what you're doing and why it's so important to you can really help you out in the long run. 
Another very important mindset to have is um, the way we navigate through life, but also the way we determine success. So we're often taught that success is our willingness to try when in fact success is really our willingness to fail because in all certainty, we definitely will have times when our projects will not go the way that we expect them to. And there'll be times where we need to try to do more trial and error than what we initially planned. And so obstacles make the path to success. So with no challenges, we will never be able to grow smarter or stronger at the same time. With every door that closes, a new one opens, and there will be more paths to choose from than the last. That, that being said, there will always be an opportunity to achieve your goal. Whatever your goal may be, all it takes is that one yes. So continue to persist because there will definitely be times where you will get a no. All it takes is just one yes to reach your goal. And we often think that creativity and inspiration comes naturally to individuals, when in fact, this is quite the opposite. We really do need to make research on a topic or something that really does um, motivate us or something that we think that's very important to ourselves. So asking ourselves questions like, what motivates me? What excites me? What is something that I believe that needs to be solved? And what's important to me can initially help us find our voice, our passion, our creativity and inspiration, which will allow us to change the world. Your age does not define you, as I always say, and I think this is one of the most key pieces of advice I would give throughout this presentation. And it's also something that I learned when working in the field of tech, especially as someone who's 17. Um, you don't usually see a lot of people going into university labs trying to complete different science projects. And so um, I learned that your actions don't define you. Uh, sorry, your actions define you, not your age. And you don't need to wait until you graduate high school or you have a PhD or you become a scientist or engineer to actually change the world. You can start doing that right now if you wanted to. And you can take on the world at any age and leave a legacy. Lastly, make learning a lifelong journey. Stay in the loop and be educated because that's actually one of the ways that you can contribute to solving aspects of the climate crisis by educating yourself and others because possibly that piece of information you're gonna share with someone else will actually be the, um, the start of their climate activism journey and um, they will be able to inspire more individuals as well. What we need to realize is that we don't necessarily need to be industry leaders or have an experience within a certain space of sustainability or innovation to actually create an impact. That is because the people who create the most impact are actually disruptors and they're foreign from that industry. And um, that's generally because their ideas are creative and can change the world and solve real world problems. So we don't need to wait until we're actually a scientist or in the climate space we can start to change the world from today by following our curiosity um, in order to make the world a better place. Your ideas and your innovations can change the world. Your future moonshots and imagination can help build the future of sustainable cities. Don't be afraid of failure or obstacles when it comes to following your passion or trying something new or changing the world. Obstacles are the, are the blocks that pave the way to success which in this case is the future of climate justice and sustainable cities. Technology will be an important part of the solution, but only partly. Therefore, to achieve a future of sustainability, we must work together by exchanging knowledge, resources, and ideas. Climate awareness and problem solving is a collective effort, one we can battle with the right tools and community power. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay, if no one has any questions, I will just quickly show um, our two people who created art for the gallery are not here, but I will quickly present their work for them. So first we have a short story. And this is a heart-rending conversation between a mother and daughter to convince the unwilling mother why her daughter cannot be a pretty flower in the garden, but needs to be the thorn on the body of the rose. So I will leave that up for everyone to read it for themselves.
it. And then secondly, we have a piece called Fairyland Utopia. And this is art made entirely from recycled materials, which promotes environmental conservation. And here's the picture right here. <laughs> 